Amen. So many good things that the Lord is doing. Let me just encourage you on a couple of practical fronts because uh, when we are in transition as we are and stepped into transition, obviously there's lots of things that you have questions about and how does the process work and all of that. Here's what we are doing as a transition team. We are meeting. I have pledged to meet with the transition team here on a, a, a regular basis. And we have another gathering a week from tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be gathering. And if you have questions that you would like us to consider, you can feel free to write those questions down and get them to us in writing. We want to make sure that we hear your heart. I love the way the Bible rolls out the way churches should function, and it seems good to us and the Holy Ghost. You know, there's this partnership with heaven in the processes of the Lord. And um, so I want to encourage you in regard to that. And then, as has already been mentioned, this coming Wednesday night, we will be gathering for our first in a series of prayer meetings where we're going to just spend time praying and interceding and getting a hold of the heart of God for this house. Amen? Amen. I know it's been said by many people many times, the future that God has is incredible for this house. I believe that with all my heart, with all my heart. I met Jacob here uh, the last time I was here and preached. Jacob, would you stand up just a minute? I tell you what, I love this guy. I love his heart. I love his heart. There was an immediate bond. And I thank you, Jacob. And then I, I haven't even met Olivia yet, but my wife met Olivia and was already bragging about Olivia just getting back here. Because there's another generation that's going to fill this house. Amen? There's another generation that's going to fill this house. And your, your sons and daughters and your grandsons and granddaughters. Amen? That's the promise of Joel. That's the promise. That was the prophetic word that God gives. And so we want to be prayerful in this next season that God's purposes would be manifest. And we're going to see something that's going to all be honoring to him and awesome to behold. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to take and invite your attention to the word today. And I'm going to preach for, how many of you give me 30 minutes? You give me 30 minutes to preach. Good. Good. Thank you. I will not drag it out longer. I can't promise. No, I, <laughs> but I, I really felt it in my heart because the board and leadership of the church, the transition team, has asked me to serve in an oversight capacity as you all walk through this transition. Um, one of the joys that my wife Sandy and I have is to serve churches in an apostolic or fathering type, mothering type role in you know, having pastored for years, um, 40 plus years, I can't even believe that, that's somebody else, I must be my dad or my grandfather I must be talking about. But I, you come across a lot of things in that, that period of time. You see a lot of things. <coughs> Through it, God gives you wisdom, doesn't he? He gives you practical understanding and one of the things that it's easy to see sometimes is when we hit transition points, it's human nature for opinion, human opinion to begin to surface. How many of you know all it takes to get an opinion? You, you can get three opinions by gathering two people. <laughs> Isn't it true? Isn't it true? I mean, you know, opinion. there's never a shortage of opinions, <laughs> I have found. All of us have them. All of us have them. <clears throat> and, um, but what we want to make sure of is this, that we get the heart of God in the next chapter for this house. And a lot of times we develop our opinions and our understanding on our history, okay? And yet God sees the future. God knows what he has in store in our future. And we want to line up with God's purposes for our future, not just for our yesterday, amen? We want to move forward in God. And so let's be prayerful. Let's be open. 
Let's allow the Holy Spirit. I, I, we believe in the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We want to see if God gives you scriptures or God gives you, you know, prophetic words. Write them down. These are things that are important to us. We want to hear them. We want to, the Bible tells us to judge them. But at the same time, we ought to be open. Amen? And we ought to be ready to receive. So we want to have that kind of culture and environment as we move through this. And uh, we're going to be standing with you and guiding and seeking to keep our hand on the tiller as we move through this process for the glory of God. So I want to speak to you today from my heart on something I really felt that the Lord dropped into my spirit. And that is on the subject of together as one. Together as one. Father, I just thank you today for your word. And I pray that over these next few minutes that you would anoint me to deliver your word into this house. May it be an apostolic word that settles on a company of people for your glory. And may we not just be hearers, but may we be doers of your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love Psalm 133 verse 1. In fact, I've talked a lot about that from time to time. I'll oftentimes mention it. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And he goes on to just say, it, for, it's, for it's like the oil that flowed down from Aaron's head, down to his beard, down to the, his garments, uh, even the skirts of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon. For there the Lord commanded blessing even life forevermore. Now I want you to notice something. God's blessing rests on those who are together in unity. Now I'm going to come back to that word together in just a minute. And we're going to focus on our, our thoughts today around that word together. And in the New Testament, you remember in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all what? Together in one place. Now, what does that say? That says that you can be in one place and not be together. They were all together in one place. And when they came together in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole place where they were seating and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire that came and sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Again, in this environment of being together in unity, there is this release of supernatural power and authority. Jesus underscored it in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. <coughs> I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Now listen to verse 20. For where two or three come together, there it is again, come together in my name, there am I with them. Wow. So this, it, it is so essential that we come together. Now, this whole thing of coming together is not just your warm body coming together. We glad, we're glad you brought your warm body with you today. Okay? We're glad to have it here. But God wants to do more than bring our warm bodies together. He wants to bring our heart together, our emotions together, our overall direction together. He wants to bring us all. The word together in this context means to collect, to join together, to join as one. Now listen to this. To join as one those previously separated and to be united as one. Now, there are some amazing things that happen when we come together. 
Not only is there a supernatural release of God's power, but there are some incredible natural things that happen when you come together. First of all, togetherness is God's answer to weakness. It's God's answer to weakness. How many of you know this, that when two come together, one can provide strength even in the absence of the strength of the other? That's what Ecclesiastes says in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help them. In other words, independence is not God's will. God is not calling us to a spirit of independence. You want to see independent spirit? Look on social media. And you can have a belly full of independence. Everybody voicing their opinion, their desire, their thing. All independent. But God doesn't call his church to be independent. He calls his church, hear me, to be interdependent. Interdependent. In other words, we need one another. I need you, you need me. We need each other. Look at your neighbor and say, I need you. We've got to have each other. Why? Because togetherness is God's answer to weakness. It's God's answer to weakness. None of us has all the strength we need. But I'll tell you what, all the strength we need is found in the body of Jesus Christ. And we are the members of that body. Amen? All the gifts that's needed to see this house go to the next level is already in the house. I love the way my old friend Tommy Barnett would say there's a miracle in the house. The miracle is in the house. So it's God's answer to weakness. Togetherness is God's answer to weakness. But it doesn't stop there. Togetherness is also God's answer to weirdness. Now come on now, help me somebody. I, you, you know, we, 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 we love each other here, don't we? Yes. But, but don't we have to be honest that there's a little weirdness in all of us? Yes. There's just a little weirdness in all of us. Uh, my wife addresses my weirdness. When I got married, I had no idea that I had as many things, as many issues as I had. But you know, the Bible says this, that the wife will be, a help, she's a helpmate. So what's she doing? She helps me by pointing out my weirdness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's right. That's right. Why? Because togetherness is an answer not only to weakness, but it's an answer to weirdness. If you're weird, you don't, you're not weird because you want to be weird. You're weird because you don't see weird. You think your weird is normal. And it takes somebody else to come along and say, no, I'm sorry, that ain't normal. That's just weird. That's just weird. That's what the body of Christ is for. We love each other. We affirm each other. But we also help each other. Hallelujah. We help each other. And so togetherness is a part of that. You listen to what Proverbs says. Proverbs 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron... So one man sharpens another. I'm better because you're in my life. You're better because you're in one another's life. We're all better because of the body of which we're a part of. Amen? And so we want to hold fast to this spirit of togetherness. Now you cannot read the book of Acts without coming away with an understanding of just how much together they were. Acts 1-4, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Acts 2-1, I've already said it, they were all together in one place. Acts 2-44, all the believers were together. Uh, Acts 2-46, they continued to meet together. Acts 2-46 again, they ate together. Acts 4-24, they raised their voices together in prayer. 
I mean, read the book of Acts and start underlining that word together, and you'll be shocked how many times it shows up. The Greek word, homathema medon, is actually an interesting word. Uh, it, it is a compound word, homathamedon. It's a strange kind of sounding word, but literally what it means is many moving together along as one. It's the picture of an army marching in cadence. Any people in the service here? Any of you are in the service? And you know what it means. When they tell you to fall in, and when they say forward, march, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, marching in cadence. Now let me tell you a secret. Do you know something? There's so much power that is expressed literally physically when you march in cadence that when they come to a bridge, they break cadence. Why? because that cadence can tear the bridge down. There's so much energy that's released. That's a natural expression of what happens when a people move together as one. And that's what God is calling His church to. Is He's calling His church to be as one. It's the same picture that you get when you go to an orchestra, how many of you like to get, hear, hear classical music and an orchestra play? Oh, yes. Like-minded souls here. But something amazing. You see all these various instruments. And they're all playing different notes. And they're different types of instruments. But they come together in harmony. And when they come together in harmony, there is a release of a sound that goes beyond just simply the natural that's happening in the instruments. Literally, you can hit two notes, and then a third note overrides that because of harmony. Harmony unleashes something. That's what togetherness does in a church. It brings an amazing release of the supernatural. Paul says so much about our togetherness. He, he nails it again and again. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, he talks about Christ and the work of Christ to both Gentile and Jew alike, that they've become heirs together, members together, sharers together. Wow. All of this is in the New Testament. This, this expression of togetherness. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, listen to this, in him the whole building is joined, what? Together. And rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built, how? Together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Paul uses an interesting language there. When he uses the word, you're joined. You're joined. Any, do we have any uh, master carpenters in the house? Any master carpenters? Well, listen, I, I grew up in a construction family. I was a building contractor. When my wife married me, that's what I did. And so I'm very familiar with building processes, and carpentry was kind of my vocation that my dad, my dad made all of his sons, he had three sons, and all of us had to have a trade. And you know why? He said, I don't care, you go to college, I think that's wonderful, you go to college, you do get your degree, you do all of that, which we did. But he said, I want you to have a trade. Because if you got a trade, you can always make a living. Yes. That's just good practical daddy advice, isn't it? 
If you get a trade, you can always make a living. You know, I may not be able to always make a living preaching, but I can make a living building. Okay? And, and so I'm very familiar with carpentry. And so that was kind of the trade that I went, went down and then became a building contractor. So when he uses this word for you are joined together, it's the actual same word that a cabinet maker uses. It's two pieces. Have you ever looked closely at your set of kitchen cabinets? I mean, they didn't come just come out of a tree looking like that. Somebody somewhere took that piece of wood and it was milled. It was run through planers. And are you ready for this? It was run through a joiner. A joiner is a little... It's got a blade about that wide and about that big around and it spins in ultra high revolutions and goes neat, and you run the edge of the board through it. What does it do? It knocks off all the little high spots. It knocks off all the little splinters and it smooths it out. Sounds like church. <laughs> you know brother sandpaper and sister sandpaper that show up in your life. What are they doing? They're helping to join you. To position you so that you fit together perfectly. Hallelujah. That's what the Word does. It, and it teaches us this. You are being joined together. As you come to Him, as we worship the Lord, as we lean upon Jesus, as we make His presence our priority, we are being joined together. Have you ever noticed you start getting changed in His presence? You start getting changed. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when He appears, we shall be like Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give Jesus a hand clap of thanks. We shall be like him. You're being joined together. And then he doesn't stop there. You are being built together. Built. Is, this, is, this speaks to a process. You're being built. Things in my experience in building houses, and we would build about... The construction, my dad and my brothers and I were a part of this construction company. We all had our jobs. And my job was to draw the plans and to actual facilitate all of that and to hold the license for the company, uh, for the construction company. My dad was into sales. He was like Andy Griffith. He could sell to anybody. I mean, he was just like, he had this, just his way about it. My brother, one brother, Larry, he was responsible for all the subcontractors. My other brother, Murray, was responsible for all the building components to be at the job. And there was a process. All of the building components were assembled but just because they were, they were assembled didn't mean we had a house. You see, that's the way it is in the church. Just because we show up doesn't mean we have a church. It's when we're built together as one that we become the church. We become this habitation for the holy presence of God. Isn't that awesome? I love the Word of God. And so... When you look at the scripture, em that emphasis on the togetherness. And then in Acts 4, verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. Now, we read that verse of scripture and we think, wow, man, look at that. I'd like to be a part of that church. Everybody shared his one. But why did they do that? Because they had already been joined together. Amen. You see, when you get joined together, you don't look at your stuff as your stuff. You look at your stuff as our stuff. How many of you got a family? You know? When I got married, I joined this gal 43 years ago, almost 44. 
May the 5th will be 44 years we've been married. And I didn't say to her, you see, we became one. Well, the two shall become one. That's a process, too. I'll talk about that another time. We, we knew we were going to become one. We just couldn't decide which one we were going to be. But we, we knew we were becoming one. But you see, when you become one, it's no longer my stuff, her stuff. It's our stuff. Why? Because we've become one. That's what happens in the church. There is this incredible release of selfless generosity when we move together as one. It just well, boom, it just happens. And you can't help it. You see your brother or sister in need and you immediately want to respond. You want to be the blessing. Why? Not because it's just the right thing to do. It's because it's your heart. You can't help it. May the Lord help us to get always to that part, at that point and live there. Amen? Amen. And that's what happened to the New Testament church. So I want to quickly give you five principles from the Word of God in order to continue to protect and bless and strengthen the togetherness. And it's found in Hebrews chapter, 19, uh, chapter 10, verse 19. The writer of Hebrews makes this statement, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now I want to just talk for uh, in my closing uh, moments of this message about five practices to help us stay together. This of being one. And it, they're underscored. All five of these practices are in this passage that I read. First of all, we want to maintain grace-filled worship. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near to God. How do we draw near? With a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Now, that word sincere is an interesting word. It's actually a Latin. It comes from a Latin word called sincere. The, the word is two words, sin, without, and sere, wax. Without wax. Now you say, what in the world does that have it to do with anything? <laughs> Let us approach God without wax. <laughs> really is a profound thought, isn't it? But what it, what it was referencing was in those days, if they were going to sell, you were going to get a nice Greek statue, and you were going to put it in your garden, You'd go down to your local statue dealer and you would buy your statue, your marble statue. However, there was this nasty practice among marble statue dealers where if there were blemishes, cracks, and defects in the marble, they would fill them up. Guess what they would fill them up with? Wax. They'd take it and fill all the cracks and blemishes and polish it nice and bright. And it looked just like the rest of the marble until you got it home and put it in the sun. And guess what? All the wax melted and ran out and suddenly all the cracks and blemishes appeared. And so the writer of Hebrews references when he says how we approach God. How do we approach Him? We're sincere. We approach Him without any 
wax. Now, when that means in reality, we don't try to cover up our cracks and blemishes with phoniness. We just are who we are. We're not perfect. Can I tell you, none of us are perfect. We've not arrived yet. We have a sincere heart. We're not full of phoniness or pretense. You know, we come and God, I struggle sometimes with unbelief. Lord, help my unbelief. Pray for me. That's why the Bible says this. We can confess our faults one to another. Pray for one another that we might be healed. Have you ever been in a church among a people that's all phony? You know, you'd think, man, the way they talk, they ought to glow in the dark. And you're like, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. And then suddenly the heat of life gets on them. And guess what? Not so spiritual anymore. Not so spiritual. The wax melts and runs out of the cracks and the blemishes. Isn't it better just to go ahead and admit we got a few cracks and blemishes. We got a few places that are not perfect. But we are loved by Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. And we are a family that loves each other. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap of faith. So we maintain grace-filled worship. Uh oh, my 30 minutes is out. How many of you give me 30 minutes? No, I want to. Have... Give me a few more. I'm almost finished. Secondly, maintain hope-filled conversation. Let us draw near with sincere heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from a guilty conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Look, look here at verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who's, who promised is faithful. You know, Pastor David, just a few days you go and Moffat, we thank God for medicine, we thank God for doctors. But at the end of the day, Dr. Jesus is on your case. <laughs> Dr. Jesus is in charge. And we know what he has already said. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of the Lord. And you're coming through and out the other side victorious. Amen. So what do we do? We hold to our hope. Sometimes we go through some challenges. Sometimes we go through trials. Sometimes life doesn't look like the fulfillment of the promise. But the promise still stands. Yes. Amen. 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 When your life is built on the rock, yes. guess what? The storms may come. The winds may blow. Yes. And it may beat upon that house. But that house stands for it was founded on the rock. Hallelujah. What is the rock? The promises of the Lord in your life and in my life. So we maintain a conversation that speaks life. We don't speak death. We don't speak criticism. <clears throat> we don't speak damaging of anybody or anything. We bless one another. We're filled with hope because we know God's taking us somewhere. Look at verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So not only maintain grace-filled worship and hope-filled conversation, but maintain love-filled interaction. I'm telling you, we need to love each other. The Bible says love each other fervently. There needs to be this hot zeal and passion of love for one another. We love and protect one another. We need that. All of us need that. When you see somebody that's going through something, love responds with compassion. and Love responds with a sense of, I'm with you. We're standing together. So that's the way we live. We maintain togetherness by maintaining that love-filled interaction. The writer of Hebrews, as he emphasizes, as he emphasizes this, let us hold, let's consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. In other words, we're looking for an opportunity to move one another forward in the things of God. Number four, look in verse 25, and let us not give up meeting together. Now this was written 2,000 years ago. As some are in the habit of doing, whoa. In other words, not coming together on Sundays, 
for worship is not a new problem. It's been around a while. Okay? Why is it that we need to show up here? I hear, listen, I've been pastoring now, as I said, a lot of years and overseeing churches. And I've had the chance to hear a lot of people through the years. And one of the biggest things that people say, you know, about something, well, I'm not being fed. Well, a couple, couple points I would say, you've got to open your mouth if you want to be fed. <laughs> You've got to be ready to receive something if you want to be fed. But a second point I would like to say is this. How many of you know when we gather, it's not all about me? <laughs> well, Paul says it this way. When you come together, each one has. And then he gives a long list of things. In other words, we're not just coming to get, we're coming to give. Do you know something? When you don't show up, somebody misses out on something that you were intended to bring to them. You have something to deliver to somebody in the purposes of God. And conversely, you miss something that somebody else has to give to you. Whoa! This is how we strengthen our togetherness. We leave a deposit in one another's life. For the glory of God. Amen. And he said, let us not give up meeting together. So we need to be faithful to God's house. Faithful in prayer meetings. Faithful. Sometimes it's challenging. I understand. You know, we have traffic jams here in Orlando. You know, and sometimes we need additional prayer for sanctification by the time we've finished with the traffic. I got it. I got it. But do you know something? How many of you have ever, you've ever had to press through and then you get here and you go, oh, I'm so glad I came. I'm so glad I came. Yeah. Because there's something enriching in our lives about being together. So we maintain faith-filled devotion. Faith-filled devotion. And then lastly, the last part of that same verse, he says, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Yeah. I'm going to tell you folks, it's not long before Jesus comes. Amen. I look at the newspapers and I'm like, my goodness, it's like reading the prophetic words of the scripture. Amen. We're seeing nations. We're seeing people groups. We're seeing all of it literally being fulfilled before our very eyes. And what does the writer of Hebrews say our attitude should be? We're filled with, enc with encouragement. Yeah. Maintained, encouragement-filled lifestyles, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. As we see things winding down, you don't get down in the mouth and down in your spirit. You're filled with the strength of the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something. Catalyst Church, God has great things in store for you. God has great things in store for you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me all over this room and the worship team could come back. And we're going to pray, close this service, and then open up for that time of reception in the foyer and, um, where you can express your love and gratitude. Pastor David, Angela, I have stood with you these 10 years. And I've watched the hand of God yes. upon your life. Amen. Yes. Upon your life. I knew when you came, you came in the purpose of God. You came in the perfect timing of the Lord. Yes. You and I spoke almost a year ago, nine months ago. And you felt this was long before you even knew about the health issues. And you felt things were beginning to shift. Why? Because God has a perfect time for the closing of a particular season because he's opening another season for you. So we today, we bless you. And I want to say before this congregation, I applaud you. I thank you for the kind of leader that you and Angela have been the way. Because this is not just a pastor. This is two pastors. 
This is a pastoral team in this house. They, they've come as one and they've served as one. And I, I just want to say what a blessing it's been to stand with you, to preach here so many times through these past 10 years, to watch what God has done. And there's been a rare, it's been very rare that I would come here that I didn't leave going, wow, what a precious, precious company of people and what God has done. So thank you for leading well and being faithful. We pledge to stand with you in faith and in prayer for a great outcome. I know there's going to be a few weeks that you're not going to be able to be in conversation face to face, but we're standing with you. And we bless you in the name of the Lord. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you today for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you that our life is hid with God in Christ. We thank you, Father, for the future that you have for Catalyst International Church. We thank you, God, that as we put the period at the end now of this season, we do so with an awareness that a new season is opening. As we close this chapter, we open anew. And we go ahead with faith-filled thanksgiving and thank you for the fulfillment of the promises that you will bring to pass in this next season. In David and Angela's life and in the life of this local church, I bless this house now. I bless every single person here in the name of the Lord Jesus. I speak and decree your blessing over these, your people. We're going to sing this song in just a minute in closing. But let me speak and decree blessing before we sing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May he be merciful to you. And may he give you peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's worship God in this song. I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes to your will, Lord. I'll as a church say yes Lord your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven amen um, we want to also recognize there was a representative that's joined us many times from child evangelism fellowship uh, where is she in the corner yes would you step forward one second amen uh, we had a little situation during the program but we want her to step up amen uh, Pastor David and Angela would you give us just one moment she wants to recognize you. Amen. And we also want to have, have her step forward and recognize as well. Amen. I was just coming today to say thank you to you both for just your partnership over the years, not just with our ministry, but 
also with me and the encouragement that you guys have been um, through all these years, both physically with this church and reaching the children in this neighborhood and the seeds that have been planted all over Orlando. So, it's been on. thank you guys. We love you, John. Amen. 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 There are some blessings waiting for you in the foyer, amen, some refreshments as we celebrate our beloved pastors and we draw this to a close, amen. Would you raise your hands with me, amen, we're about to get the final benediction. Thank you to all for coming, amen, may the Lord continue to bless you. Now may the love of our precious and wonderful Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Have a blessed week in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Please be blessed with the refreshments and please greet our pastors on your way out. God